Good evening, and a very warm welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to our lecture series. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The General Society, for those of you who this may be your first visit, was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City, artisans who represented 22 different trades. Today, our 234-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, our Lot Museum, which is upstairs, and you're well, more than welcome to visit after tonight's talk, the General Society Library, of course, of which you're in now, and our nearly 200-century-old lecture series, of which, of course, tonight is part of. You will find out more information about the Society from the blue and white postcard on your seat, and information about joining the library is available on our front table. Tonight is really a very special occasion, and I can't tell you how honored we are to have um, Jan Seidler Ramirez here tonight. J Jan is the founding chief curator and executive vice president of collections at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum in Lower Manhattan. Just a little bit of background before, about Jan before I introduce her. Uh, Jan served as vice president and mu museum director at the New York Historical Society, where she played a major role in developing that institution's 20th century collecting program and its History Responds Initiative. A series of exhibitions, public programs, and acquisition efforts focused on the 9-11 attacks in their broad historical context. In her career, Jan has held curatorial, interpretation, collections and development and senior administrative posts at museums in Boston and New York, including the Museum of the City of New York. She's taught, lectured and published extensively on American history, arts and material culture. It is now a huge pleasure to be able to introduce to you Jan Seidler Ramirez. Thank you, everybody. You're, you're very um, noble to come and uh, as the holiday season is starting <laughs> and engage with this topic, which never ceases to be emotional. Um, when Karen asked me to speak, I love these opportunities because I can, I, it's like a beading exercise and you can always pull out a different bead, uh, a set of beads, in this case, a long strand of beads and you know, see, see where you're going with it. It's always different. So tonight uh, I've done that, um, but mostly I really wanted to chat with you as New Yorkers about how you create a collection around uh, a, a recent tragedy um, at the actual site of that tragedy. And I wanted to um, begin um, by mentioning a sort of un unexpected accolade, I guess, that you, you could call it, that recently bestowed on the museum. And that is that um, annually, the website TripAdvisor um, invites its users to score uh, their experiences in museums around the world. And um, in 2018, the National September 11th Memorial Museum um, was actually ranked number one, the number one museum attraction in New York City, the number one museum attraction in the United States, number two in the world, um, after the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, but it's really the notion of the attraction that is a funny rub. It's a funny word to, to apply to what we do. Um, and I think we've rational, rationalized that um, as really representative of the unusual chemistry of memory and history and reverence and 
resilience that uh, visitors experience when they make their way down to our site in Lower Manhattan, which they've certainly been doing in very significant numbers. Um, more than 42 million people have visited, reflecting absence, the uh, outdoor memorial uh, since it was dedicated on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And um, I think something like 13 million people have visited the museum since it was opened in May of 2014. Now, let's see if I can get this to work. And um, there you see the memorial and the museum in the background. Um, many visitors, too, um, gravitate to the memorial and to the museum because they really do want to support uh, their complementary missions to restore uh, names and agency and personhood to the nearly 3,000 uh, victims of the September 11th attacks. And the museum, of course, uh, tackles that assignment through the authenticity um, of evidence uh, it draws on to narrate this history. So that's sort of the additional um, attraction. Uh, today, as of 2018, um, our permanent collection, which you'll hear more about, um, encompasses all media, all formats in which these events were um, recorded, um, interpreted, memorialized, um, and today that uh, numbers around 17,000 artifacts, about 3,400 uh, oral histories, and just you know copious um, visual imagery and archival footage and tribute art and born digital records and so forth and so on. It's very rich and it continues to grow as the meaning of the event continues to grow. For those of you who are New Yorkers, um, you may remember that a museum specific to September 11th actually wasn't part of the original vision for the Memorial Precinct. Um, a quite generous space at um, street level had been reserved for uh, the in International Freedom Center, um, which aimed to offer a very uh, broad brush survey of the fate of societies that have freedom and don't have freedom of various kinds, thereby turning a critical lens on um, hotbed topics like slavery and gender discrimination and the struggle for civil rights uh, germane to the history of the United States. Um, and it was that fault-finding potential that really undermined the future of this institution once its plans went public uh, when an alliance of 9-11 family members and first responders protested um, the IFC's choice as a tenant for this uh, site, a very recent heartbreak. Um, a sympathetic press um, joined that chorus, resulting in the IFC's abrupt cancellation in the fall of 2005, um, which catapulted forward the alternative plan to do a 9-11 centric museum. I can assure you there was no honeymoon period for the replacement project. Uh, controversies continue to stalk practically every mile in the journey of delivering the Memorial Museum, um, starting with the very significant challenges of storytelling around a subject that is uh, not only painful, but also still <clears throat> uncoiling um, as those of us on the Project Front Lines were rushing to sort of fix a first draft uh, of that history uh, and trying to do this under intense media scrutiny, um, a climate of superheated local, national, and global politics with a lot of diverging expectations about what was and what wasn't uh, appropriate to present on these charged acres. In 2006, um, the future home of the museum remained a raw hole in the ground. Uh, it was a tinderbox of sensitivities. Um, and while most new museums are built to house objects, um, this one was actually an artifact um, unto itself, defined by the archeological cavity of the missing World Trade Center. Some <clears throat> likened it to a giant um, eccentrically configured reliquary. It took about nine years uh, 
to complete the museum and, and much of that gestation you know, happened out of sight underneath the eight acre memorial which serves as the museum's roof. Um, the New York architecture firm of Davis, Brody and Bond uh, were brought on to manage the build out of the below ground um, museum. The primary narrative experience today flows through about 127,000 square feet of a cavern that is studded with the skeletal vestiges of the towers and their original foundation. Um, and uh, the main visitor pathway descends uh, seven stories down to bedrock, which represents where uh, uh, human engineering really interfaces with Mother Nature's glacial deposits of schist. So it's a, a, it's a very dramatic, potent space. Um, there's a ramp, as you can see, that um, offers progressive revelations as you um, overlook the space. I want to say a, a, a word, sidestep for a moment, to call attention to the words that are actually conjoined in our title, Memorial Museum. Um, these are relatively new forms of cultural institutions. Um, Memorial Museums are hybrids, really, charged with the entwined tasks of educating um, while honoring, um, of straddling history and remembrance, um, and trying to achieve that right balance between the head uh, by drilling down uh, into facts and the heart by setting uh, aside opportunities for paying tribute. It's, um, I can assure you, a very complicated tension, more so when the institution itself uh, does occupy the actual scent, a, a site of a mass trauma. For the 9-11 Memorial Museum, um, a way to navigate those dualities emerged from the real estate assigned to it. Um, how, and I'll mention that, um, because the outdoor memorial, and I hope many of you have been there, um, privileges the tower footprints as two one acre size pools that are lined with waterfalls that plunge 30 feet before the water then disappears down at a sort of a deeper uh, void, um, the below ground space of the museum uh, actually inherited a bit of a problem. Um, it inherited two mammoth stalactites of plumbing apparatus, basically. Um, in a very masterful move, uh, the uh, architects decided to camouflage these protrusions with a silvery cladding, you can see it there on the left, uh, a sort of foamed aluminum cladding, uh, an effect which summons to mind really the ghost volumes of the towers and also created two separate programmatic spaces under each of those volumes. And this enabled us to centralize then the functions of commemorating the victims and demonstrating the world's uh, compassionate response to 9-11 in the South Tower uh, zone, so to speak, and situating the harder hitting um, evidentiary um, historical exhibition underneath the North ta ta Tower volume. So visitors uh, to the museum have choices. They aren't ambushed for the for, for, for the, by the historical e exhibition, which is told in three chapters. They elect to enter it and they can also um, exit it as needed. I also wanted to call attention to um, what we call Memorial Hall, which really serves as the fulcrum uh, between these two geographic hemispheres. This um, crisscrossing uh, corridor is actually the result of a early pledge made to 9-11 families to locate within the future memorial envelope a permanent repository for the unidentified remains of the victims uh, once uh, a space was ready to accommodate it. And that facility, um, under the exclusive operation of the Office of Chief Medical Examiner, OCME, uh, now resides behind uh, that east-facing wall. Um, it's inaccessible to uh, visitors, it's inaccessible to the museum, to museum personnel. And what you see on the upper left is um, a glimpse of what was called Memorial Park, um, the temporary holding station 
uh, with a tented structure that was next to Bellevue Hospital. Um, here on the lower right, um, you see the artwork by uh, Spencer Finch that was commissioned for the museum facing wall. Uh, he titled it, Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky. On that September morning, um, it represents 2,983 um, individually hand-painted squares of blue, no shade repeating itself. Um, and with it, uh, there is the quote from Virgil's The Aeneid, uh, made with letters that are forged from um, recovered World Trade Center steel. And our intention uh, with this wall was to remind our visitors that the um, weight of our concerns at the Memorial Museum is not with accounting for $9 billion of uh, vanished real estate. It's about the incalculable loss of fellow human beings at this site. Um, usually museums uh, make exhibitions uh, by harnessing the storytelling power of their in-house collections. And when we started this project, uh, entered the starting gate, there was actually no reserves to pull on, um, except for the very potent asset of the actual site, the strong um, sort of phantom limb memories that so many New Yorkers uh, had about the site, and an abundance of um, witness accounts and stories from the day of September 11th, which we intended to solicit for um, our nascent oral history archive. Five years um, after the events, um, the early bird opportunities for direct acquisition and transfer of materials were over. Um, several weeks after the attacks, uh, a consortium of local curators and archivists actually uh, came together to pool their efforts to appeal to authorities on behalf of museums and history. And uh, through this persistent lobbying were eventually um, given clearance to tag for safe, safekeeping certain categories of salvageable uh, material. And I will admit I was one of those wranglers um, on behalf of the New York Historical Society. So I was you know, familiar with the rescue work that had uh, happened in 2001, 2002. Uh, I knew many of the objects that were in those receiving museums. And although I assumed um, that loans could probably be negotiated, which indeed they were, I was honestly covetous of you know, creating an independent collection, a standalone collection for the new 9-11 museum. And you'll spot some of us there. We were at the Fresh Kills Landfill in 2002, um, placing paper hold labels on certain artifacts that had br been brought there for inspection before they were disposed of or recycled as scrap met uh, metal. And um, I can assure you that this tagging system was not especially reliable, um, given the strong winds up there on those sort of weathering heights in Staten Island. I, I'll go back just to say, probably the worst choice of pants I've ever had to be photographed in. I'm on the upper, upper left, but my, my colleague, Amy Weinstein, who works with me today, still looks great. Um, <laughs> terrorism um, is an act of human engineered violence. It's not a tsunami. It's not a wildfire. Um, it's not the outcome of any other kind of natural disaster. And so from the outset, we had aspired to gather and present material evidence that would incriminate the hijackers in the museum's fact finding a fact, factual historical exhibition. By 2006, however, a brick wall really was thwarting that effort because the trail of tangible proof connecting those 19 perpetrators and their enablers to the plot were now in federal lockdown by the FBI and the Department of Justice and were unavailable for release. Um, we worked very long, we worked very hard to gain access to those trial exhibits, some on, seen on the screen, but to this day they remain enclaved and reserved for their day in court uh, if and when the pretrial proceedings in Guantanamo are concluded. However, there really were some positives about our delayed collecting campaign. Um, and the first was that sea of 
potentially available visual documentation produced by everyday citizens who had grabbed cameras, they had grabbed camcorders, they had grabbed every conceivable type of image capture tool uh, and that morning to record what it was they were seeing. And I'll add um, that the one thing they didn't grab, thankfully in terms of you know, my curatorial ability to <laughs> navigate it was there were no s smartphone cameras yet. They didn't come onto the shelves in commercially until uh, the winter of 2002. Um, it's estimated that over a third of the world's population experienced that awful spectacle in real time on the streets, on, on television, on the internet, um, and most of these fortuitous uh, picture takers were not co contractually obligated to TV st studios or to print publishers, and thus they were at liberty to donate their images to the museum and have. Um, and just as uh, the Civil War was really the major first event chronicled by the new medium of photography, uh, September 11th was really the first extensive test of digital coverage, um, which required us in 2006 and up until this present day, um, we had to devise a strategy for preserving those now very fugitive, uh, primitive se seeming formats. Also on the near horizon, we didn't know it when we just were getting going, but were the renewed investigations of Ground Zero that were led by forensic archaeologists reporting to the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Shortly after our project was underway, some previously undetected um, human bone fragments and a victim's personal effects turned up in a Con Ed trench being repaired along the western edge of the site. And this very unsettling discovery resulted in a second wave of excava excavations and rooftop searches in the cause of finding remains. Um, it was a multi-year effort uh, that also yielded um, field finds that were actually ungermane to the Office of Chief Medical Examiner, but of unquestionable interest to the new museum. And on this screen, you see uh, several of those examples of unearthed items um, on the left, um, artifacts traceable to the site's pre-20th century history, which are very useful for reminding visitors that the New York was a thriving port of world trade and consumerism centuries before the World Trade Center uh, was built on landfill near the Hudson River downtown. Um, and on the right, um, upper right, um, artifacts traceable to the site's uh, modern history. 9-11 um, recovery workers uh, were, were really astonished by the rarity of workday trappings they came across as they were on site. You, you never would have known, uh, they said, a, a 200 and, 220 combined floors of office space had been birthed in, in the towers. Um, so destructive was that force of collapse that um, when they found a paperclip, it became newsworthy. Um, that same pressure, though, had uh, apparently driven other things deeper into the earth. And uh, these began to surface with these renewed digs. Um, occasional you know, office tools, like the floppy disks, um, and the desk Rolodex, which are now in our collection. So in a weird way, uh, the ground of Ground Zero actually became a donor uh, for the collection. But by far the most uh, of greatest value, value to our emerging collection was the birthright given to our project by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. We had the first choice among about 1,800 artifacts that had been housed in a vacant hangar at JFK Airport, wrestled off the pile and the Fresh Kills landfill uh, beginning the late last week of September of 2001. Um, it was really an extraordinary effort um, undertaken by a team tasked by the Port Authority <clears throat> with saving, if possible, relics of infrastructure from the World Trade Center. Um, you see here a shelter that was 
actually extended to about two dozen or so um, battered emergency apparatus. Um, and you can note here on the lower right um, the um, sort of directive spray painted on, onto that recumbent piece of steel save. Um, I, I will just add that the um, sort of archiving under extremists was not an agency mandate uh, at the Port Authority, it never been part of their missions, but they just worked exceptionally and incredibly hard to salvage this tiny little percentage of the agency's physical heritage, um, anticipating that someday um, these artifacts might benefit um, educational or memorial ventures um, linked to the September 11th tax. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. They, 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 they've given it all away, and I, I'll, I'll talk about that afterwards if you remember that question. Um, Hangar 17 warehoused most of the monumental objects that visitors see today in the museum. Um, and through their distortion and their scale, these, these massive remains of the day really helped to telegraph the brutal physics of 9-11. Consider here um, the examples of the so-called impact steel, um, spears of building structure splayed apart when hijacked Flight 11 plunged through the upper floors of the North Tower. They, um, these kinds of artifacts caused many installation challenges um, given their size, their, their tonnage, um, and the logistics required to uh, insert them back into the museum before the overhead plaza was sealed over. There were also design ethics and considerations to finesse. I mean, these were broken building bones. They were not contemporary sculpture, and aestheticizing their um, strange, intriguing torque uh, really had to be avoided. Um, on the screen, you're seeing two sections of impact steel, one at the left uh, undergoing a mounting test we did out at the hangar before it came down into the site, and uh, at right, a 25-foot-tall section that commands the vista now of the museum's South Tower volume. Um, strategically, these colossal you know, space holders help to dramatize the, the macro impact of the attacks. But equally important were the much more intimate micro tremors sort of found in human scaled artifacts, which thrust real people into that story vortex, everyday people who, like us, were imperiled because they went to work, because they boarded a plane, because they attended a meeting, or they delivered an egg sandwich to the wrong place on the wrong day. And our design scheme, um, enabled by the collection we were building, we knew how to be elastic enough to accommodate not only the gigantic, but also this kind of humble, vulnerable object. Um, personal property that was recovered at Ground Zero, for instance, wasn't just anti-mortem evidence of a mass homicide. Um, these items were also cherished affidavits of human life Sometimes a wounded um, two by three inch plastic ID badge, uh, commonplace except for its context here, was all that came back to a victim's next of kin, outliving the person depicted on it. They were sometimes returned in sealed biohazard bags uh, to contain the grit and the jet fuel uh, stench. And thus, although these objects were you know, really proxies for the disappeared, they were often just too wrenching for their receivers to keep, which accounts for their representation in some numbers today in the museum's collection. 9-11 uh, generated staggering statistics. Um, as a memorial museum, however, our job was to prevent those huge numbers from turning into a numbing abstraction. Um, this required sensitizing visitors to how this event touched the lives of real people. And so empathy really was key. Uh, and for 
our collecting purposes, this meant identifying and uh, building relationships with the different groupings of people, of protagonists, who were going to be present in our narrative. Um, these were people that held a stake, the stakeholders, in how the story was going to be communicated to the general public. And our end goal, curatorially, was to convert those key stakeholders into donors of material that could um, authenticate their experiences. This kind of audit um, pivoted around questions of which, consti which constituents felt ownership in Ground Zero and why. Um, there were many you know, legitimate claimants. Um, legally, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey controlled this devastated land plot. Uh, they had built the World Trade Center, they had established their headquarters there, and they had suffered the loss of 84 agency employees on September 11th, uh, their executive director among them. The city of New York was another interested party, uh, very keen to repair and renew these savage downtown acres for practical and economic and civic morale reasons. I will also note that um, just about six weeks ago, uh, uh, the repairs to Cortland Street Station number one train was, were finally finished 17 some years later. So it was, you know, the city of New York was interested in this. Um, but the mainstay of our collection uh, really represents the flesh and blood actors who uh, constitute the demographics of what has been called the 9-11 community. So, you know, who, who were they? Sentimentally, uh, Ground Zero really belonged to two converging armies uh, who took up stations on that bucket brigade. One uh, here, uh, you know, representing the traffic of in rushing emergency responders who came to help, um, many of them paying the ultimate price. Um, for the next nine months, their colleagues stood vigil on site, searching round the clock for the missing. And in their eyes, Ground Zero was a battleground. Um, no soldier, no brother would be left behind. Um, it's very moving today because new classes of FDNY probies and police cadets now visit the Memorial Museum as part of their onboarding. Um, and it's moving to see them sort of absorb the reality of an event that is quite distant in time to most of them. They were children. Uh, and uh, an event that convulsed their respective departments, resulting in practices, change practices that are now baseline to their training. I will also add uh, that sometimes these in incoming ranks include the children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews uh, following in the footsteps of uniformed service family members who were killed in the line of duty on 9-11. Augmenting the emergency responders were the legion of hard hats and sanitation crews and disaster relief volunteers who also mobilized downtown and stayed until the job was done. They carted away 1.8 million tons of wreckage under punishing conditions. Um, at first, uh, they attacked that mountain of compressed jagged debris with uh, pickaxes and, and compound buckets, um, which then yielded to cranes and grapplers and heavy-duty demoli demolition apparatus. And by New Year's, that pile had turned into the pit. And really by dint of their blood, sweat, and tears, these recovery workers exercised a very strong claim to Ground Zero. On September 11th, about 22,000 people escaped with their lives from the World Trade Center complex, and another 400,000 were evacuated off Manhattan Island by boat. And understandably, these uh, survivors, some still suffering from PTSD and you know, unmerited guilt over coworkers who were unable to get to safety, they cared very much about how their ordeals would be uh, conveyed in the museum. And their contributions often reflect um, a sense of rushed exodus 
items that um, uh, were quickly stowed in backpacks or pockets or worn on their uh, person or on their feet like the heels that you see here uh, mostly carried down 87 uh, flights of stairs by a North uh, Tower office worker, um, a foot where choice uh, she certainly came to reg regret later that uh, day. This is Joanne is there on the far left. 32,000 Lower Manhattan residents were also forced to abandon their fouled homes and apartments for months, sometimes for years. Uh, for them, the World Trade Center had been their shared backyard, and they too felt entitled to be represented in the, in the museum and its collection. Um, we were the neighborhood museum, and for them it was important for the museum to acknowledge their experience of domestic uh, violation and dislocation. Downtown businesses also were devastated, especially smaller retailers and street vendors without insurance. Uh, their goods were contaminated. For weeks afterwards, shoppers you know, were prevented from entering the stricken zone, and um, their reliable customer base, which had been in the World Trade Center, was no longer. Um, this crippled economy uh, also needed to be corroborated in some fashion in our collection, and we now try to communicate some of that story through the time capsule of the Chelsea Jeans Store, uh, which is displayed in the museum uh, with its inventory of sort of strange ashen sweaters and folded pants, which were left untouched by the store's proprietor who decided to enshrine them uh, when he returned to the store rather than toss out the merchandise. Very interesting uh, conservation challenge, I can assure you. Um, Ground Zero uh, also became a destination very meaningful to members of the US military. Within hours of the attack, New York reservists had been de deployed to enforce a frozen zone around the area and to patrol the financial district and other landmarks that were uh, potential high-value targets. Uh, all three crash sites, of course the Pentagon, uh, spurred enlistments by newcomers and by veterans uh, who were motivated to join the new war on terror. By the time the memorial was um, under construction, soldiers returning from Afghanistan, from tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, were making their pilgrimages downtown. Um, sometimes uh, they were in wheelchairs. Um, I, I met a group that came in hospital beds. Um, um, I'll parenthetically add that um, re we now hold reenlistment ceremonies on the Memorial Plaza, and each November uh, the museum hosts a series of programs and recogni recognition events to salute those in military service. But no group um, has staked a stronger moral claim to the site than the bereaved, for whom Ground Zero, for many, was a an unplanned cemetery. As of 2018, 40% of the 2,800 people killed in New York at the World Trade Center uh, continue to elude positive identification with the thousands of unclaimed human remains um, in the custody of the medical examiner's office, um, a predicament that has deprived the relatives of the rituals of proper burial um, and really significantly complicated their grief. And for those who were denied that cold comfort of certainty or who loved ones came back to them in, as fractions, um, ground zero is a sacred ground. It is restless, but it is also a very reverential space. And we have always had that in mind in what we, what we do there. I would say that that kind of unimaginable truth of you know, children, parents, spouses, partners, siblings, uncles, cousins, who were obliterated in this fashion have really prioritized our engagement with this sizable stakeholder community uh, of family members and we have worked with them for many years um, to gather uh, tangible proof of those unfinished lives. Um, today, objects and memorabilia donated by next of kin um, in memory of their loved one represents about 25% uh, of our permanent collection. And because there are no time limits for accepting items um, that can individualize uh, a victim, uh, these holdings are uh, steadily expanding. 
I will note that um, these types of things that have come in can vibrate very differently depending on, of course, their provenance, where they were found, uh, and also how and where they're utilized in the museum. For example, in the historical exhibition on the North Tower footprint, victim-connected artifacts, especially recovered personal effects, often communicate very harsh truths. Consider the flattened helmet that was issued for protection to Kevin Pryor uh, of Squad 252. Uh, moments before the North Tower, Tower fell, a radio report situated him in a lobby area somewhere around the 24th floor of the North Tower. He was trying to aid um, uh, people that were trapped in an elevator there. Um, when, uh, after 9-11, his helmet surfaced in the wreckage. Uh, it was returned to his parents on Long Island, uh, who later entrusted it to us. And um, I will always remember that out of uh, earshot of her husband, Mrs. Pryor, confided that she'd found, you know, strands of her 28-year-old son's chestnut hair, you know, matted inside it. It was just a very intimate object. Um, the helmet's condition refutes any kind of softening euphemism applied to death after 9-11 um, to spare public sensibilities, as clearly firefighter, Fry, uh, firefighter Fr Pryor was never lost. Um, he had not perished. He hadn't expired like a food product. A 110-story building had collapsed on top of him. In contrast, um, are the readings conveyed by objects that we purpose for uh, sharing in the museum's memorial exhibition located in the South Tower space? Um, and here, uh, things most often perform as prisms into personality, suggesting you know, how people lived on, on the job and off the clock, not how they died. Uh, case in point, um, the choice of items received in memory of Charles Zion, uh, who was an equities trader and a hard-driving senior vice president, Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, at home in Connecticut, that same strong arm uh, preferred to swing a golf club, apparently uh, his family said not very accurately because he had marked his golf balls with the identifier lost, um, assuring that whenever they strayed into the rough, a finder you know, would, would know whose locker to return them to. Uh, these were also knitting hands, a hobby that he pursued to relax from uh, high stakes finance. Um, and soon after 9-11, his widow had found this project um, left unfinished, like his life. In the time um, remaining uh, this evening, I, I want to delve a little bit further into two groups of affected people um, who are referenced in the museum's mission statement. Um, in addition to, of course, the pledge to remember the victims and the survivors of 9-11, uh, this vow extends to, quote, all who risk their lives to save others, un end quote, and, quote, those who manifested extraordinary resolve compassion, and leadership in the wake of the attacks. This is an acknowledgement of the thousands of extraordinary, ordinary Americans who took action when it was needed most uh, during the escalating crisis on September 11th and during the very fragile, the very tough months that followed. Um, and much of the effort of our curatorial team has been invested in really fortifying the museum's collection with evidence of their essential contributions. There are 412 named emergency workers who are recognized as victims of 9-11. Uh, that equals about 15% of those who were killed. Um, it's a tally that includes men and women and several sets of uh, biological brothers. It includes the beloved chaplain of the New York City Fire Department, Father Michael Judge. However, um, the figure excludes the flight attendants aboard the four doomed aircraft who were really the morning's first true uniformed responders in flight. Um, it's a number that also excludes uh, unknown numbers of civilians who came to the aid of coworkers and strangers and, and perished when the buildings um, fell. 
Since uh, the museum opened about four and a half years ago, um, it's really become a beacon for visitors from around the world who are seeking uplift from the stories of valor and professionalism demonstrated by first responders on a day when so many of them, uh, so many of the rescuers became victims themselves. Um, the next sequence of slides um, are specific to the FDNY, um, which suffered the greatest casualties on 9-11, and I apologize um, to the New York City Port Authority police, the EMTs, the court officers, and all kinds of life safety personnel whose sacrifices every bit as deserving of acknowledgement and whose interventions on 9-11 are also represented in the museum and in our collection. It's... Um, Probably no surprise that uh, this fire truck uh, called Ladder 3, shown lying in state uh, at the threshold of the historical exhibition, um, is really emerged as one of the most pictured artifacts in the museum, uh, at least as measured by its star turn on Instagram and you know, other social media sites. Um, the truck's gravitas, I think, you know, commands immediate respect. It's, infirmities, the twisted weeping ladders, uh, the decapitated uh, front cab, all speak to the event it collided with here uh, on the morning, or here, the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th. Uh, the object we have attached to it specifies that when the alarm sounded before 9 a.m. that Tuesday morning, 11 members from this particular company of senior firefighters uh, jumped on the truck uh, and sped downtown. Um, and like so many of the responding units, Ladder 3 was riding heavy uh, with men coming on shift and others just rotating off duty, but who elected to join the run anyway. And none from this uh, truck, none of the 11, ever returned to their East Village firehouse. Um, quite wordlessly, the truck's condition uh, summarizes the larger fate of 343, 343 New York City firefighters who made the ultimate sacrifice on September 11th, uh, serving as a surrogate for all of those highly committed and trained rescue workers, all of them, who were caught in the crosshairs of this um, catastrophe. Um, the FDNY's loss of personnel on 9-11 equated with 4,400 years of aggregate training and experience, erased in a matter of two, 102 minutes. Um, bravery, seniority, uh, body armor, um, none of this offered any immunity from this uh, ca catastrophe. In his long career with the fire department, uh, William Feehan, who you see on the upper uh, left, uh, had held every position and rank from probationary firefighter to deputy commissioner of the department, which was the office he held when he was killed by the collapsing South Tower, um, making him uh, the highest ranking member of the fire department to die in the line of duty that day, and at age 71, also the oldest. Um, the badge that you see below uh, was found on his person and returned to his children, who then later donated it to the museum. Even um, St. Florian, the patron protector of firefighters, couldn't work a miracle for Rescue Force uh, Darrell Pearsall, who was wearing this good luck uh, medallion around his neck. Uh, that was later recovered with his remains and his, his special tools. When Ladder 3 was lowered into the museum by crane through a hatch hole that we left open in the memorial uh, plaza to accommodate it, the object received full department honors. Uh, despite the blistering heat of July on the day of the ceremony, attendees wore the, their Class A dress uniforms. A chaplain was there to offer a solemn benediction. Uh, bagpipers played for the company's survivors, for the widows and children of the victims who were invited to bear witness. And um, the, these proceedings really underscored for us uh, the importance of offering rituals of final rest to these damaged rescue vehicles that were destined for the museum. We have about four um, 
on behalf of those who would never reboard these vehicles. It was a, uh, it's not, let's just say, in collection management, it's not a best practice to do this kind of thing. And we found that these were such exceptional circumstances we had to work, work, work out something. Um, Needless to say, the heroics and sacrifice of New York's bravest and finest um, emerged immediately as themes, recurring themes, in the explosion of tribute art uh, that followed 9-11. Um, we've collected examples in myriad forms, quilts and sculptures and banners and paintings and decorated motorcycles and uh, snow globes and holiday ornaments. Um, uh, these variants are, seem endless sometimes. Uh, of course, we've collected uh, photography uh, documenting some of these more ephemeral eulogies on surfaces that sometimes can seem surprising. For example, the barn door on the right from in rural Orange County, um, quoting that iconic photo by Tom Franklin of the three firefighters raising uh, the flag in the ruins of Ground Zero on the afternoon of the 11th. Um, and then on the right, uh, that extraordinary um, tattoo by a firefighter who submitted his back to that pain uh, for an indelible tribute to his fallen company members, um, a sentiment he emphasized um, by the title he attached to the back tattoo. He called it, all gave some, some gave all. Um, and let me also share our, our very first acquisition of a fire door uh, on the lower right from what's on the upper left, a little bit of rogue art uh, for mu municipal property, but thankfully uh, no one had the heart to enforce those kinds of regulations in the wake of this tragedy. Uh, the mural um, embellished on the door, um, which is from engine 205, uh, ladder 118 on Mid-Off Street in Brooklyn, um, references eight firefighters who were killed at ground zero. They here are reincarnated as eight stars blazing over the night sky of the city. Um, and in addition to the kind of wind rippled flag there uh, at left, another prominent feature of the composition is the Brooklyn Bridge, which they crossed uh, that September morning bound for Lower Manhattan. The motto of this company was under the bridge. Um, the work was actually a creative collaboration between one of the firefighters who had served at the house and two local Brooklyn Heights residents, one of them a 16-year-old high school student, uh, aided by her father. And they really wanted the spirits of those eight to guard over the rigs as they exited and return to the firehouse um, in into eternity. Um, we've left the door uh, banged up on the lower left. If you come to see it, you'll, you, you'll, that was an intentional uh, preservation because we, they wanted to suggest, we wanted to suggest the haste of many of those departures in and out of the um, of the firehouse. Uniforms uh, were not an admission requirement to support the rescue efforts on 9-11. Many self-dispatched volunteers uh, and skilled tradesmen penetrated the police lines to assist. Uh, and with hindsight, we know uh, that the last person found alive in the debris pile was, now, was found on the afternoon of September 12th, bringing the total number of successful extractions to 20, 20 people. Uh, ambulances that were uh, awaiting uh, the injured stayed empty. Um, search and rescue dogs on the pile grew so despondent that their handlers had to start hiding themselves under the rubble to rekindle the dog's motivation. Um, by the week following, um, uh, 9-11, um, a credentialing system had been um, instituted for all seeking access to the site because of its extreme hazards um, and the importance of locking it down as a crime scene. Um, New York City's Department of Design and Construction took charge of managing this process, starting with verifying the training of anyone who was keen to help and standard standardizing their use of personal protective equipment, at least in theory. Um, as rescue optimism faded, the priorities at Ground Zero transitioned into an outright um, recovery and destruction, de deconstruction and cleanup operation, um, a feat that was accomplished by uh, Memorial Day um, 2002 with just incredible speed. An estimated 
90,000 people participated in this effort um, with union workers um, and construction trades serving really as the backbone of the effort. They were um, carpenters and iron workers and plumbers and pipe fitters and teamsters and longshoremen and electricians and operating engineers and welders and waste collectors, and, and that's just an abbreviated list. Um, and laboring, of course, beside them were the uniformed firefighters and police officers, officers, members of the clergy, civil engineers. It was just this just extraordinary effort. effort. Um, you see some of these folks um, uh, depicted in th these very noble faces, a sort of recorded, re which were recorded through a giant Polaroid camera in the studio of um, Time Life photographer Joe McNally. Um, just weeks after September 11th, his studio was located about a mile north of uh, Ground Zero. It's just an outstanding archive of about uh, 246 portraits um, now in our collection. In canvassing this vast community over the years, we've acquired a stockpile of gear and outerwear and access badges worn on the site, which many had saved as sort of proud passports. Um, these objects help to humanize that ground zero aggregate. Um, and also, um, they, they often come with highly personal reflections from the men and women who contributed them. Um, especially um, resonant are the battle-worn boots and uh, work gloves that many have donated. Um, uh, many of them, with uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the shoes, um, have blistered soles, which speak to the burning metal. They had to work a walk over on frequent boot changes were absolutely essential because the fires uh, under the pile were not extinguished until late December. Um, and on the right, a uh, pair of gloves that were given to us by uh, an ESU officer, David Brink, who remembered picking them up at a supply station uh, on site on a day, a very discouraging day of digging, um, and then noticing the message of support on their palm. And he, probably written by a str stranger who had sent the gloves there, and it reminded him that the rest of the world cared and appreciated his exertions, and it really rallied him. Um, in the startup phase of uh, the operations, there was a lot of specialty equipment and electronics dispatched to ground zero, kangaroo cranes and ultrasonic probes and pole cameras and so forth. These, these, these things came and went very quickly. What stayed from the beginning to the end were welding torches and tried and true hand tools, shovels and rakes and garden trowels that were suited for the precision coming of debris in the search for small body parts. Um, there were also uh, lightweight sled, sleds called Stokes baskets, which were uh, kept uh, on reserve just in case something was found and needed to be respectfully carried off. Um, grapplers were um, you, the ubiquitous workhorses on site. Um, their operators performed this wonderful sort of uh, touching ballet with the FDNY personnel called spotters in which the claws would go and they would um, pull a big um, mouthful of debris and rebar up, very, very gently shake it, invite the um, spotter to come over and have a second and a third look uh, for any traces of remains or clothing that might indicate a body was in the, air, in the area. We actually have one of those um, claws that are now uh, on display in the museum in the collection. This work um, was never routine. There were risks, contingencies. The labor was physically and spiritually taxing. Um, passions ran high, especially uh, when conflicts developed over the differing uh, priorities of recovery and cleanup. But this conglomerate of people um, really grew into an efficiently uh, governed provisional city, uh, very respectful of the expertise that each subset brought to the mission um, and learning to offer one another support. Um, I will also say that um, 
people don't think of the 9-11 Museum as having special exhibitions, but we do. And uh, this just went up. It, it's a, it's, it's a, a tribute to um, the group of highly skilled iron workers called Skywalkers, who had a long and interesting connection uh, to the site. Um, fathers, grandfathers having come to build the original World Trade Center, their sons having come to participate in its deconstruction, and their grandsons having come back to raise the new towers and high rises, high rises downtown. So it's a, it's a very wonderful story. Um, this camaraderie, uh, at, of this community at Ground Zero is also a beautiful, you know, thread through our collection. I'm just pulling out two objects um, to speak to that. Um, this was a um, lanyard and ID on the left worn by a Salvation Army vol volunteer who worked at the um, food tent nicknamed the Taj Mahal at Ground Zero. Um, as the weeks passed, her lanyard uh, became thick with pins and patches and mass cards um, that had been given by uh, grateful recipients of her very warm hospitality. I mean, crisis had jump-started this community, but really true friendships um, emerged from it. And then uh, shifting scale and holding pride of place in the museum's uh, foundation hall is the majestic uh, last column, which is a 36 foot tall fragment of one of the South Tower's uh, core columns. It holds further distinction as the last upright piece of steel that was removed from ground zero, signaling the conclusion of recovery operations. Um, this particular column um, resurfaced around mid-March um, during the dismantling of a temporary dirt roadbed in the southeast quadrant of the site. And as the debris clearance uh, escalated, the city of New York finally dared to consider uh, a gesture that could maybe commemorate the ceremonial end of this epic work. Um, and their eyes started to uh, converge on the aptness of carrying out this last uh, holdout column. Um, by then, uh, rescue and recovery workers um, had already started to paint uh, their agency initials, their respective casualty numbers uh, on, on it. You can see them high up on the shaft. And as more of the columns started to emerge, members of the building trades, um, uh, relatives and friends of the victims also began to attach uh, flowers and prayer cards and photographs and union decals and, and flag stickers. Um, um, it was just incredible. Um, on the opposite face, you can't see it, um, construction workers painted a very prominent number 2427 two, um, in honor of the estimated number of um, civilian uh, casualties. And once uh, a date for the column's removal was set, um, municipal workers and government workers also hastened to add their signatures and their messages, um, as did the volunteer corps who had supported all of this. Um, over a two-day period in late May, the column was cut down. It was shrouded in black. It was draped with a large American flag. And just after Memorial Day, it was carried out on a flatbed uh, truck led by a riderless horse escorted by representatives from the Ground Zero community. Um, by then, it had really um, earned celebrity as kind of the, the first truly indigenous memorial to those who had lost their lives at this place. And also, um, it was recognized as a monument to the collaboration and perseverance of those who had come to help and had stayed to uh, repair. Now, um, I wish I could end this story, um, which I'm promise you I'm going to do in a second, um, on this very sort of proud, upbeat note. Um, but history isn't always that predictable. Uh, there was another chapter to this community story that was festering. Um, and uh, that story uh, is tied to those two apocalyptic clouds rep representing the pulverized collapse uh, contents of the North and South Tower, um, the energy released by them, you know, registering as seismic waves or earthquakes in five surrounding states. It was so powerful. And the eerie residues, as some of you will remember, uh, coated lower Manhattan, it wafted over to Brooklyn, uh, causing some <clears throat> people to liken it to a nuclear 
snow, which had never really been seen. Intuitively, uh, it was understood that those avalanches contained the mortal essence of human beings, um, imbuing that dust with a reverent uh, connotation. But as time has um, confirmed, those cloud components intermixed with the fires at ground zero also set in motion an environmental disaster that was um, miscalculated for weeks, if not years, in terms of its adverse impact on human health. Um, the uh, perception of the World Trade Center dust therefore started to evolve from something that was sort of tragically and ineffably human, uh, everything we hold uh, most dear, uh, to everything we should also fear. Um, according to the Centers of Disease Control, uh, 400,000 people were exposed to pollutants released when the towers fell, um, and that witch's brew of toxins uh, subsequently endangered thousands uh, from the rescue, recovery, and cleanup community who worked at and around the site. Um, today, there are 83,000 individuals living in all 50 states who are enrolled in the CDC's World Trade Center Health Monitoring Program, and as of Labor Day 2018, uh, there were almost uh, 9,800 responders and survivors who had been diagnosed with 9-11 related cancers and ailments often suffering multiple conditions. Uh, the museum's collecting has therefore had to take a sobering turn um, with respect to documenting this communi community, just one example, a pillboard created by a fellow named um, uh, Freddie Naboa. Uh, he was a paramedic who had worked on the buck bucket brigades uh, prior to 9-11. Uh, he was a healthy non-smoker, rarely took an aspirin. But by the time this photo was taken at, at a rally advocating for the government's help in um, meeting the medical care needs for the underinsured uh, ground zero personnel like himself, uh, Naboa was no longer able to work. Um, he was reliant on 23 prescription meds a day and breathing apparatus to stay alive. Um, so severe were his respiratory problem, pro, uh, problems. Uh, the, bo the bottles on the pillboard um, actually represent the emptied shelf contents of his home medicine chest. But we've also tried to gather items representing the grassroots campaigns that were mobilized to gain these individuals and their families adequate medical uh, treatment and disability compensation, um, a goal that was finally achieved with the reauthorization of the James uh, Zadroga Act in 2015, um, which will help meet the needs now of these, these, this ailing population through 2090. On the screen, um, you see the patch-covered jacket that was worn by activist John uh, Field. You see him there um, worn on countless trips he made to uh, Congress and to Washington, D.C. to appeal for coverage and compassion, um, often accompanied by the late-night uh, host, uh, John Stewart, who is on our board at the 9-11 Memorial. Um, John himself had, uh, had his foot uh, crushed, left foot crushed uh, by a beam that had toppled on it on his second day uh, at, uh, on the pile. Regrettably, um, legislation isn't curative, and as of today, uh, about 1,700 responders and survivors have died, um, almost a quarter from the FDNY and the New York Police Department. A, a half of the folks who are enrolled in the World Trade Center Health Program have been now diagnosed with at least one 9-11 certified illness, creating a collateral generation of 9-11 victims whose numbers may someday exceed the 2,983 names that are etched on the memorial pools. Um, so these you know, repercussions just defy closure. Um, but as the story evolves, the museum memorial are committed to evolve as well. And one very public demonstration will arrive sometime uh, next year with the dedication of the Glade on the southwest uh, quadrant of the outdoor memorial. Um, fencing just went up around it in anticipation of this work. Um, as conceived by Michael Arad um, and Peter Walker, designers of the original memorial, this modification will feel organic 
It will take the form of an outcropping of six boulders appearing to push their you know, way up and skyward from the plaza's otherwise uh, horizontal plane. Uh, the stones will be rough. Uh, they will be worn, but they will also convey natural strength, um, gesturing the fortitude and dedication of the thousands um, who contributed their best here. Um, visitors are, will also probably encounter a quote or a short statement to that effect um, made from reforged World Trade Center steel. Um, we feel that it is time and it is right uh, to formally acknowledge their service and their sacrifice at this venerable place. This is the last slide. Um, unavoidably, um, of course, the museum's narrative and, and collection and the collection that responds to it have had to reckon with the individual pain and the collective trauma that are at the root of September 11th and its consequences. Um, the institution, however, offers far more than um, the autopsy of a single day defiled by terrorism, which altered our global uh, security. Um, it is equally devoted to the story of September 12th, uh, the story of thereafter, um, reminding our visitors um, about the durability of love, the sanctity of life, the power of our pooled resolve, um, and the common um, decency and repairing impulses that connect us as human beings and, and, and do not divide us, especially when you know these deeply shared values are attacked as they were on September 11th. Um, so this is part of what we mean by never forget. Um, it was impossible to have foreseen 17 years ago in that bleak aftermath, but uh, the backdrop our visitors encounter today when they exit uh, the museum and the memorial is perhaps really the consummate takeaway message. They are seeing a reborn skyline, um, concretizing the city's resilience. Uh, they leave the memorial plaza through a grove of living, flourishing swamp oak trees uh, whose leaves undergo seasonal changes. Yes, they drop, but they also bud out each spring and they offer um, a canopy of refreshing sh shade. Um, and I think these are cues um, that confirm that 9-11's uh, legacy also embraces hope. It is not petrified um, in despair, unless you're trying to find uh, a parking space around the memorial. <laughs> so that is my presentation. I'm happy if you have any time. Oh. Just, I, I, I couldn't resist sliding this in, which was um, taken by my terrible cell phone camera yesterday. But yesterday, we invited all the surviving members of Ladder 118 um, and in 205, um, family members whose loved ones are the stars, um, the young woman, not so young anymore, uh, now graduate student and her dad, to come to the museum because we've just installed the door in our tribute corridor. And it was just a really a wonderful moment uh, to watch. So if you have any stamina left to ask questions, I'm happy to. Yeah. I have a. Uh, yeah. How? Right, it's a great question. So the, the question was about how the names are, are arrayed around the memorial pools. And the original concept, which was never implemented, was that they would be randomly uh, arranged because um, Michael Arad, the designer, said this was a random act of violence. You, you died, unfortunately, because of where you were, not necessarily who you were. Uh, but I think family members in particular, they had had spent way too many months and years waiting and looking, and they did not want that. So uh, a, a modification uh, was achieved where um, the sort of intelligent geography, if you died in the North Tower, your name would appear there. If you died in the South Tower, your name would appear there. Flight 11, which came in, uh, you know, would be on the North Tower. Flight 175 that came in the South Tower. All of the first responders were 
uh, grouped on the South Tower pool together because the point was made that they were a, a differently um, moving traffic. They were sworn municipal employees doing their sworn duty, and that traffic was a little different than the innocent people that were just, you know, attacked in the buildings. So they're grouped um, together. We also gave uh, family members uh, an opportunity, if they wanted to, to have their loved one's name arranged near or next to um, a friend, a coworker, a stranger who had helped them that day, a biological brother, uh, an in-law, a fiance. And so I think there were about, um, about 1,800 of those requests received and they've all been honored uh, on the memorial. It's, it's meaningful to the families. It is not going to be necessarily meaningful to the public unless they you know, pick up a, the app or you know, a, a, a guide to it, but it's a, it's a very beautiful thing to see. Please wait for the microphone to ask your question. Thank you. I have uh, two, two parts of uh, rather the same uh, question, because you mentioned that still we don't know more than uh, probably, if I remember, 50% of people we can identify with DNA. Mm -hmm. And the second part, you said that seven, 700 uh, people, workers, they work after, after catastrophe, after tragedy, died for cancer. Of course, this cancer were caused by asbestos, mm -hmm. where there were and, uh, three towers. Yeah, because three towers collapsed. Last one was yep. 50 floors and was fully evacuated. Mm -hmm. And of course, a second part, this is the same question, because you show some steel, mm -hmm. steel construction, because this building is engineer society. Mm -hmm is uh, the best professionalist in New York State and maybe in the United States, and uh, maybe is a small proposition for uh, this engineer's society, maybe send us some, some engineers. They know how this building, why they, be, uh, they collapse. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, I was on a meeting and with constructor who made a Petronas Tower in, in Kuala Lumpur later, yeah. he cried us, this was, an, I, I don't remember what, what place, he, because he didn't do project for a high terroristic attack Mm -hmm. means play uh, two planes mm -hmm. with full full uh, gasoline and Let, this if I can just step in for one second I would say I, I because you, you you brought up a lot of interesting points um, first just to the the medical exam, examiner's office has made an internal pledge to work to do what they can as science improves to find um, DNA matches um, to the remains in their care. And the one, the most recent announced um, match uh, occurred this summer. It happened to be uh, for um, a, a young man um, whose father is on our board. Um, the young man's name was Scott Johnson. He was 26, he worked in the South Tower. And up until this time, his parents had received nothing back. But that was how far you know, science had traveled. Um, to the issue of the, the, the whole engineering of the towers, um, certainly one of the biggest um, conspiracy theories we hear and deal with all the time is um, it was an inside job, you know, the, uh, it imploded, uh, Building 7 was really, you know, a, a false flag, all of this. So, so we take this on in the museum because we, we and we, we talked very hard about this, you know, do you ever even give credence to this nonsense? But 
we figured if we, if we took it out, it would only make people think, what else did they take out? So we, we proportionately um, do a little piece about conspiracy theories. And you know, f facts speak for themselves. It's nonsense. But you know, they're, they're, people are great at spinning nonsense. I, you know, so there's that. And the final thing I was going to say is that um, if you're, I think you also had asked about the World Trade Center steel. One of the phenomenal things the Port Authority did, because they had, you know, unbelievable amounts of this tangled steel left, was on the 10th anniversary they um, instituted a steel giveaway program for any community, any house of worship, any faith, you know, any any responder agency in the world that would come to them with a plan to do a memorial from this steel. Uh, the deal was they had to come and remove it on their own, they had to pay for those costs, uh, and they had to write a sort of simple dec declaration of the use of the steel, and all of that steel is now gone. It's all over the world. I mean, it's just, it's sort of a diaspora of memorials made from the World Trade Center steel. It's very impressive. Any other questions? I was just um, wondering, the design rendering for the Memorial Glade had those six boulders that emerged from the ground. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of the number six in the context that of That is a the really glade? good question. I'm not sure I know. <laughs> I, I think one looked a little too weird, or maybe they, you know, they were trying to balance it. I'm not sure, but I do, I do know that they've quarried the stone already. They've gone, it's a, it's, it's a Canadian, Canadian stone granite. Um, and it's we've just seen the rough hewn pictures of it, um, and it you know it's in it's in a part of the memorial we call the glade, which is um, has grass and um, you know it's not it's not at the pools, um, but family members when they come hopefully feel they have a place to go. There's a, a room for family members, private room in the museum. Uh, survivors feel their story is told. All those stakeholders sort of find themselves. But the rescue recovery workers felt they had nowhere to go um, and actually find one another and kind of grieve with uh, one another about all of this second generation of of suffering. Um, and so, you know, we, we heard them and we, we agreed. Yes. <clears throat> this will be the last question. <laughs> yes. Um, the, does the museum have any connection to the, the new building, the uh, Freedom Tower? No. No. Um, we get, nope. <laughs> um, uh, we're often asked about that. We have, you know, things in the collection about its building, but um, uh, you know, we 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 own and operate our site, but our landlord is the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. So, as those of you probably know, um, the 16 acres of the World Trade Center are not controlled by the City of New York. Very interesting dynamics. Um, so, you know, uh, in a way, we report to two governors of two states and. Um, you know, this, the city of New York is, of course, highly interested in what's happening. You know, they've got infrastructure running through it, and uh, it's it's complex. But all of New York City real real estate's complex, right? Okay. Thank thank you very much. Thanks. Yes. If, if we could ask you to remain, sure. uh, Jan. I, I would just like to thank you for such an exceptional presentation, so moving and so powerful. And we're very honored that you could share your experiences in building the collection. And you covered so much. And we also want to thank you for the focus on the tradesmen. Thank you very, very much for speaking here this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And we would like to make a presentation to you, and to do so is our executive director, Victoria A. Dangle. And Jan, again, I, I join Karen in gratitude uh, for what you have worked to put together. You have your sensitivity, your brilliance in discussing this 
terribly difficult topic. I not only speak to you as an, the executive director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, but I speak to you as a native New Yorker. I speak to you as the daughter of a local 14 operating engineer and crane operator. I speak to you as a, as a, a person who was on Wall Street on that very day and enveloped in dust and walked those streets. As a person who I would say conservatively lost about 18 people that I was connected to, and you are able to summarize the time. And I want to call special attention to a very good friend of mine who is here, who is one of those people, Lori Giolito Spampanato, who lost her husband on September 11th, and we know each other since high school. And Lori, Lori raised three boys, the youngest of which was 20 months, 21 months old, they are brilliant, they are kind, they are handsome, they are loving, they are devoted, they're athletic, just like their father, Donald Spampanato. So, and what a testament. So we have this museum, and then we have the living proof, like Lori's children, of the, the life that continues. But there, sometimes I say there's never a reason to say never forget how could you ever forget? So thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you have done. So thank you. On behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Jan Seidler Ramirez, Executive Vice President of Collections and Chief Curator of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum for creating a collection for the 9-11 Memorial Museum for her participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So thank you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you are wonderful. Thank you. I just, just wanted to say, of course, I am part of a large collective. And yes, I It takes a I village. Uh, in our case, it took a huge municipality to get this done, so yes. it's not just me, of course, but I, on behalf of my colleagues. Yes. Thank you very much. You're very special, no question. So thank you. And normally we would make um, our lecturer a lifetime member of the library, but you are already, from what I understand, a library member. But you'll never pay your dues again, because you are a <laughs> lifetime right. member. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. Uh, fine, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, this, this evening. I hope you'll jo now join us with a, cla a glass of, for a glass of wine, and I'm sure uh, Jan would be happy to answer informally some questions. I also just want to mention our remaining two lectures of the series, uh, Victory City with John Strasberg on Thursday about the impact of the Second World War in New York City, and indeed um, uh, Manhattan's Architectural Secrets with John Toranak, and John actually is here tonight, and we look forward to seeing him again next Tuesday. So I hope you'll be able to come back for those. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Moot. Right. Oh, and, and forgive me to keep, I would just like to detain you for one more second. Um, Jan re mentioned the steel remnants of 9-11. We were fortunate enough to obtain some of those remnants, and they are upstairs in our lot museum, and you would be more than welcome to go up and visit them tonight. Thank you so much again. <laughs>